It's wonderful to see so many faces from other London institutions and to have people joining us from Warwick, Oxford and Reading. Um, I'm delighted to be part of this formal welcome for Professor Tim Lang in his lecture, Sustainable Diets for All, which is part of the Innovative Food Systems Teaching and Learning IFSTAL public lecture series. And you know, I can't think of a better place to, to host this, this lecture. If I was to create a word cloud of the work of, um, of Tim Lang, I think the kinds of words that would pop up would be interdisciplinary, culturally aware, possibly controversial, and certainly critical. And this is also how I would, how I would describe SOAS. So in our 100th year, SOAS still brings a fresh eye to debates. We are the leading specialist institution for the study of Asia, Africa and the Middle East. And embedded in the SOAS DNA is the diversity of perspective, cross-disciplinary working and critical evaluation that's crucial to understanding so many of the world's problems. So this is a remarkable fit with the interests of IFSTALS and also with that of LCIRA, the Leverhulme Centre for Integrative Research in Agriculture and Health, of which I'm also a member. LCIRA El El was set up to be an interdisciplinary centre, a place for cross-disciplinary working, so that it could find a holistic approach to the study of food security, nutrition, and the shaping of food systems, because that is what is, e is essential in our approach to this set of topics. So I cannot think of a better place or a better group to hear this lecture and to respond to it. So with that, let me now hand over to Dr. Angela Wright, who is the Chief Scientific Advisor at Compassion in World Farming, if style advisory board member and the chair of this evening. Angela. Well, thanks very much, Deborah, and SOAS for hosting If Style's second public lecture. For those of you who signed up because it was the great professor Tim Lang, but you're not too sure what If Style is, it stands for the Innovative Food Systems Teaching and Learning Programme. And there are seven higher um, education institutions involved. And as we've heard before, we've got Warwick, Oxford and Reading with us on live streaming until after Tim's talk. So hello to you in Warwick, Oxford and Reading. So IFSTAL is really about connecting postgraduate students specialising in different areas of the food system. For example, plant science or food anthropology here at SOAS. Um, so really, it's key, system thinking, joining up a broad range of disciplines. This is my third year of involvement uh, with IFSTAL, and I was honoured to be invited to chair. Tim is a friend to Compassion and has worked with us over the years. We're a predominantly an international farm animal welfare charity operating in 15 countries, including China and America. Um, but we work increasingly on food systems thinking because it's clear that for you know, food systems to work, um, intensive livestock production may not be the best way of going about it. Anyway, on to Tim. It's possibly one of the world's best kept secrets that Tim tried to retire last year. And then Brexit happened. <laughs> so we're pleased that Tim is here to talk to us about sustainable diets for all. Is it academic pie in the sky or an ecological public health inevitability? Oh, and Tim, I gather you've been banned from talking about Brexit, so I think maybe a little penalty system might be in order. Every time you mention Brexit, we're going to knock a minute off your time. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Tim Lang. I think that's a bit unfair, <laughs> um, because I actually have got a mention for Brexit at one point. Um, but anyway, thank you. Uh, thank you very much both to Deborah who's had to go and to you, Angela, and to everyone coming. Um, and I wouldn't come, to be honest, if I didn't think IFSTAL wasn't great. 
It is, actually. It's a really... Gr I mean, I was... I ran the city end of it before going part-time. And it's a really, really interesting experimentation of developing and sharing thinking. So I'm going to try and communicate and contribute to that. Um, I'm going to do sort of headline slides like this. Um, what I'm going to try to do in this lecture is discuss what do we mean by sustainable diets? Does it matter? Do they matter? Sometimes I use it as a collective noun. Is there any engagement with this issue? What's the state of play? Um, what can be done? What next? Where is it going? Uh, but I'm going to try to answer my question first. Um, my question, it is actually a question, sustainable diets for all, is it academic pie in the sky or is it inevitable? Um, and I'm going to answer it. I think it isn't pie in the sky. Uh, I hope I'm going to convince you it's evidence-based. But the problem is the complexity of the evidence. The problem is the multidisciplinarity of the evidence, and it's not getting translated into change. Uh, but that therefore means that sustainable diets are not being achieved. It's not happening. The rich world is becoming ever more unsustainable, and the poor world is locked into other problems. This, therefore, I think, really does make disruption to the food system more likely. And I don't use that word lightly. Food industry people talk about disruption, meaning, you know, a new brand on the block. I mean disruption in the way that we talk about it in food systems. Systems collapse. So very serious stuff. But I think there are some hopeful signs of engagement, but not enough. But there are ideas that we can look at and critically assess about what to do and there's some very important experience that we can draw on. So basically I'm going to explore the sustainable diets discourse and make suggestions for what to do. What's meant by sustainable diet? Well, it's not a new idea. Anyone who's ever been taught by me on our masters at City uh, knows that they're asked to read Malthus. Um, you know, you come on a modern food policy course and what do you read? Something by an obscure Englishman in 1798. Um, well, it's because we're still debating with him, actually. We're debating about his very simple idea that population was growing too fast for the capacity of agricultural systems to increase supply. And it was basically what we would say in modern terms, a mismatch. But essentially in the 19th century, uh, most of agricultural development and research and development uh, proved him wrong and set out to prove him wrong. And in the 20th century, it's really been rolled out. The big inputs into agriculture, the big inputs into redefining efficiency for agriculture, the beginnings of intensification, the extension of 18th century, indeed 17th century land use reforms and, and plant and animal breeding were accelerated. But the modern discourse of uh, sustainable diets really begins at the end of the 19th century with uh, American nutritionists like W.O. Atwater uh, and others, uh, Roundtree here in Britain, who started looking at what was a good diet, how much food did people need to have to be able to live uh, a basic existence. That was what Roundtree did. Atwater was looking much more at how much food did a worker in the steelworks need as opposed to a farm worker, as opposed to someone uh, in a domestic circumstance. And that kind of thinking of differential and differentiated thinking about nutrition essentially percolated through into welfare systems, through, notably through Roundtree, uh, but then was applied in World War II. And essentially, I think one of the critical moments in sustainable diet thinking really is here in Britain uh, with the uh, mass efficiency and mass success of rationing. The notion of rationing basically stems from Malthus. But in the Second World War, Britain pioneered a notion of rationing for the public good. Rationing so that the rich didn't overconsume while a pregnant woman was underconsuming. So there was a coupling together of some of the welfare and philanthropic thinking about food systems from the 1930s, showing the inequalities in health, the inequalities of access to food, was essentially applied in the first rational application of sustainable diets, but they didn't call it that, they just called it rations for good uh, and appropriate health. 
But the modern discourse, what you probably expected me to talk about, really begins in the 1970s. And the first and always cited, rightly, was by a friend of mine, uh, Frankie Moore McPay, an American who wrote a best-selling book called Diet for a Small Planet. Essentially, this was environmentalism, that we're running out of food, running out of space, therefore we have to eat differently and, different and appropriately. And in science, actually almost everything that Frankie Moore LePay in California, at a small think tank where she did the work, uh, basically is still being argued about. It's really quite remarkable. Sorry, being expanded, but broadly that thinking is still there. Less meat, more plant-based, more appropriate, more local, all sorts of themes that are still alive and well. But the modern academic discourse really begins, without a shadow of doubt, in a very short paper, six pages by, again, two other people I know, because I'm old, um, uh, Joan Gassau, a professor of nutrition at uh, Columbia, well, actually at Teachers College, and Kate Clancy in their 1987, 86 paper called Diet, like, Dietary Guidelines for Sustainability, the first juxtaposition in the literature of sustainability and diet. Uh, but Malthus was basically talking about that too. And in the last 30, 40 years, well, 30 years, this has basically expanded very slowly initially, uh, but then in accelerating in, the, 19, in uh, the late 1990s, and really in a big way by 2010, such that the Food and Re uh, Climate Research Network set up here in London by um, Tara Garnett, now at Oxford, and Barbara Burlingame at the FAO and Sandra Dernini there, creating the huge Sustainable Diets Scientific Symposium for three days, uh, in 2010, I chaired the, uh, the group that gave the classic definition there. But the ecosystems thinking had gone way beyond Brundtland, way beyond. People like Pete Smith here in, in Scotland, David Tillman in the States, really serious ecologists, looking at the way in which food was a major driver of ecosystems destruction, plus climate change, the climate change agenda coming up, biodiversity, climate change, land use, plants, and stresses in the food system were essentially modernizing and recreating, actually, the Malthusian thesis. Uh, our problem now is really, what can we do about it? Uh, and our problem, I think I've written here, is really one of complexity. Here is some of that sort of literature that I was pointing to, and we're waiting at the moment here, the second bottom uh, uh, bullet point, the Eat Lancet Commission, of which I'm a member, uh, is uh, Lancet, the, the medical journal of the Lancet, throws a lot of people into a room for two years and says, come up with the answer to this. Um, and the commission is called Healthy Diets from Sustainable Food Systems. That's going to be reporting in April, May next year. Uh, and what that's doing is number crunching and really very, very sophisticated modelling and then saying, OK, so what? What can we do about it? The problem, however, is complexity. And one of the big themes I want to give you, here we are in the food systems discourse of IFSTAL. Uh, do we deal with complexity by taking simple slices through it, focusing on single criteria, so do we just say a healthy diet is good and if you, everyone in this room or at Oxford or Reading or, uh, uh, or Warwick was immediately to only eat a totally evidence-based healthy diet, well, without a shadow of doubt, their carbon footprint would come down from where it probably is. But will it resolve the problem of biodiversity in that? It's not clear. Will it resolve the problem of water? I'm looking at my hero and mentor, Tony Allen, from SOAS here in Kings, in, in the front row here. Does it resolve the issue of water? I think Tony and I would agree, no. So we have a problem of what do we do? Do we set up multiple criteria? Or do we just say, look, the world is difficult enough without you lot coming along and saying food and diets have got to be dealt with through very complicated multi-criteria perspectives. Let's just deal with nutrition and the rest will look after itself. I am firmly on the right-hand side. 
firmly on the right-hand side. We cannot resolve the problems, the evidence problems uh, of sustainable diets if we only stick to the left-hand side and say, well, it's all about nutrients. Or equally, if you're only interested in biodiversity, that you only eat something that's protecting biodiversity, that therefore will resolve the problems. Uh, so uh, we have actually uh, uh, good grounds for this issue. But let's just run through. And preparing this lecture today, I've distilled it down. Pamela Mason, my colleague, and I have written an enormous 440,000 book, which if you want to look at it, you can see all of this in much more detail with 1,000 and 1,500 references. Uh, but basically, I think I want to explore I think three arguments. If I have two minutes with a Prime Minister, this is what I would say. Why does this matter? It's because diets are becoming unsustainable. If we carry, the world carries on eating in the way that we're doing, um, food will be the biggest accelerator of climate change, the biggest destroyer of biodiversity, the biggest user of water, the biggest despoiler of land use, and oh, by the way, it's the number one killer on the planet. I mean, the catalogue is astonishing. I'm not going to go through it all because we're under some time constraints. But here is uh, um, the much cited uh, uh, Stefan and Rockström. This is the Stockholm Resilience Centre team, uh, but it's global, showing how if we look at the planet uh, as, as a set of boundaries, um, um, basically, we're beginning to exceed the safe operating space, this is the argument here, uh, uh, of, of keeping things in green, and we're going into yellow, and some are already in, in red, in, in, um, in, in danger, phosphorus, nitrogen, uh, and uh, the biosphere integrity is basically a combination of biodiversity and extinctions. Uh, and Angela's organization, CIWF, co-hosted with WWF, the biggest conservation organization in the world. A really very spectacular conference uh, a month ago, a month and a half ago, about animal extinction. I mean, so here they are, an animal welfare organization having to deal with extinctions and World Wildlife or, uh, Fund, as it was, WWF, a conservation organization, has now made food one of its five top campaigning issues globally. The evidence just points that we cannot deal with the problems that we have as single issues unless we go into other territory. So even if you want to start in a single issue, you have to end up addressing the multiple criteria. Meat is one of the big features. This is the FAO's last big review of the data by Gerber et al. Essentially, it's one of these complicated uh, slides, but basically this is all the, the greenhouse gas emissions from animals. Different, here's chickens over here, and here are uh, beef over here. Uh, beef and cattle, milk, are way the biggest factor. I mean, there are actually many, many more poultry on the planet than there are cattle, um, but the cattle are way the biggest purveyors and emitters. Um, uh, if we look at land use, uh, this is anyone who I've, I will have shown some of these before. You can see here we are in Brazil. Average Brazilian have, uh, Brazilians have on average about four and a half hectares per person to feed themselves. India, less than half uh, uh, a hectare. And this is total land use. The actual agricultural use, cropland, is that brown bit there. This is the Amazon. Okay? So you could say, well, we've got lots of land, let's, let's uh, just plough up and destroy the Amazon. If we do that, then the knock-on effects of carbon sinks and climate and water, uh, so on, uh, happen. Uh, and here, in honour of Tony, it's not one of his bits of work, uh, here's a very early by one of his ex-students and acolytes. Uh, here's a, you know, 2,500 or 2,400 litres of water being used to make one 150 gram burger. And this kind of work has expanded enormously based upon Tony's really pioneering work of thinking about embedded water and virtual water. So this is a different way of thinking about food, not just thinking about calories or carbon, but of thinking about all sorts of other externalities. And this literature has expanded. I'm a boring academic, some of you are as well, the rest of you are ordinary people. But this, this data has expanded, just exploded in the last 20 years. 
and all centering on food, and food is now the elephant in the room. It's the elephant in the political room. It's the elephant in the food room. It's the elephant in, in the biodiversity room. We cannot avoid it unless we deal with it. Uh, the problem is that guidance isn't helping us. We're not getting guidance as to what a good diet is. And this was the last attempt that uh, we made here in Britain, the multi-criteria approach, <laughs> translated as trying to sort out for the British government, what should its thinking on food be? Well, do you focus, as the cabinet report of Food Matters said, let's deal with carbon and calories? Three years later, the conclusion from inside the British political machine, this was the Sustainable Development Commission on which I sat, concluded, no, you can't actually deal with food as just being about calories and carbon. You've got to deal with quality issues. People judge food by quality. You might say it's all about carbon, but they say, no, 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 it's not. It's about quality. What do I think? It's about my values, social values. It's about the environment. It's about health. It's about the economy. It's about things like trust and governance. So we developed this six-cell approach to dealing with the complexity. If you've ever had to deal with ministers or uh, academics or, or, or whoever, you have to try and summarise a complex picture in two minutes. This isn't a bad way of dealing with the complexity of sustainable diets. It's about these six things, minister. And you've got to make sure school meals deal with all of them. You've got to make sure farming systems address all of them. It's not good enough just to have one. And the interesting thing for us intellectually is getting the connections between land use and animal welfare, or between availability of food for health with seasonality, uh, to get efficiency together with environment. Social and ecological efficiency is very different from a conventional economic notion of efficiency. So suddenly there is really interesting political economy thinking developing from this. Uh, so the third reason I said was that I think, I think I've tried to explain it. Basically the argument is that sustainable diets are very interesting intellectually for us as academics because they are basically interdisciplinary, uh, they require interdisciplinary thinking. Where is there any engagement with all of this? Well, I want to quickly run through these five sort of levels. The answer is, it's patchy. I'll do it very speedily in our book. We do it at much more length, and there is now a very big literature uh, on some of this, and we've got a paper coming out in Proceedings of Nutrition Society shortly, where some of this is spelt out. If we look at the global level, uh, we find there are now the Sustainable Development Goals. 17 Sustainable Development Goals, 169 targets, at least 70 of them involve food. You cannot deal with the SDGs unless you deal with food. So suddenly, people who are all signed up to the SDGs, even big companies who help push for them, are now realising they've got to address it, big food companies. The Paris Climate Change Accord, the Convention on Biodiversity, which is actually 25 years old this year, and I think the missed opportunity of the International Conference on Nutrition of 2014. But that, even though it didn't deal with sustainable diets, despite being under pressure, it did set up the 10 years that follow, we're in it, did you realise, we're in the decade of nutrition action. Has it made a big difference to you? No, nor me. Uh, but actually, this is a very, in UN terms, this is an interesting umbrella emerging, which is dealing with this. There are some of the sustainable development goals. You can look at just two, or you can look at 12, or you can say, well, the majority of them are actually needed. And there is the FAO definition that I helped, well, I chaired, um, at the three-day conference of 300-odd scientists, or 300, not odd scientists, but 300 <laughs> scientists, who are all, of course, very decent people. And this is apple pie and motherhood type thinking, but you can look at this um, as a consensual statement. There's a full-page version of this document you can see on the web if you want. At the national level, what have we got? Well, there's been experimentation. Sweden was the first. 
Sweden in 2009 published environmentally effective food choices where it's uh, food equivalent to the Food Standards Agency and National Food Administration and the Environmental Protection Agency spent two years sifting through the data and said, dear Sweden, we've got to eat differently. Eat seasonally, eat locally, eat no less, much less meat, eat plant-based diets, all the conventional things anyone interested in this area know. It was made to withdraw it. It was made to withdraw it by the European Food Safety Agency. It was made to withdraw it almost certainly under pressure from an American meat company, the biggest meat company in the world, Smithfield, then owned by Americans, now owned by Chinese, uh, which had bought the former Soviet Union Polish pig factories in uh, uh, Poland. And uh, the Polish government complained. And so the Swedes withdrew it, but they didn't give up. They came back six years later, I was there when the Prime Minister of Sweden relaunched essentially the cultural messages. And the reason they were made to withdraw it the first time round was because it was against the common market. It was against the single market by promoting seasonality and localness. This is very interesting in a time of the word I'm not allowed to mention. <laughs> I think you're still awake. Uh, the Netherlands approach is very different, slow, incremental. The Netherlands, as always, is going to be the most interesting country, uh, not least because Unilever is a big player there. But Unilever is pulling out of its fats. It's, it's dealing with the problem of sustainability by basically selling its fats divisions, which is interesting. Germany has taken a different approach. It's done a very soft cultural advice. It's been churning out advice for the last... 12 years through its uh, Sustainable Development Commission, uh, through the Sustainable Shopping Advice uh, uh, since 2003. The UK, we went up like a rocket and then was stopped by the coalition. It was developing very fast. That uh, six cell approach I told you about was developed for this process there, but it stopped. Britain has done nothing other than the excellent green food project that Tara Garnett and, and others were involved in, uh, but basically the government said at the end of that, stop, we're not going to take any more, it's up to you. So green food principles were developed, but uh, have not been activated on. In Australia, the national nutrition guidelines were being turned into sustainability terms, and then they were made to stop when uh, the uh, uh, Australian meat industry lobbied hard to get it withdrawn. So all environmental advice was removed from their national uh, nutrition advice. And the United States, for those who have followed it, um, the biggest review of environment and food was done for the five-year, by law, dietary guidelines for Americans for 2015. And the Secretary of State, this was under Obama, not Mr. Trump, um, uh, uh, refused to accept it and just ignored the evidence. For those of us who believe in evidence-based policy, here's an example of evidence looking for a policy. So the evidence was denied. So we have a patchy set of thinking. The global framework is there at one level with the FAO, but the FAO uh, 2010 definition was ignored by the FAO's own conference, the International Conference on Nutrition uh, in 2014, but has emerged by implication through the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, and certainly from the Paris Climate Change Accord. Uh, but what is interesting is the local level. It's the local level where there is vibrancy. But there, we've got a problem. We've got things like the Milan Urban Food Policy Pact, now 144 big cities on every continent in the world have signed up to addressing the problem of food. London has signed. And part of that package is to agree to have sustainable dietary guidelines. In other words, to try to get some uh, a match, as opposed to mismatch, between what the evidence says we need to do with uh, eating uh, and, and what is going on. And it, both here and in other parts of Europe and in North America, very vibrant sustainable food cities movements. 
the clay at the bottom will mean very little to almost all of you here, perhaps, but as actually is the international organization uh, linking local authorities. 1,400 towns around the world are members of that and have now made a commitment to start trying to engage with sustainable diets. So there's something very interesting happening there's a, a mix of national experimentation, blockages, some soft measures coming forward. I'm going to talk about um, uh, Brazil in a moment. And at the, at the sort of uh, immediate personal level, uh, well, here I've done some slides, but I won't go through them. Germany, I think uh, here's Brazil. What I liked very much about Brazil, when it was going through this, it looked ahead and said, we won't try to link environment and, 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 and culture and economy and do the Tim Lang sort of uh, six cells approach. We'll stick to nutrition, but we'll sell it only as about culture. The, cult, the nutrition guidelines for Brazil were only launched on cultural basis. Here is their document. Nothing about nutrients. Read particularly the last. Uh, as the chair of the committee said, our advice to Brazilians was, if a food has been advertised, think very carefully about eating it. <laughs> it's brilliant. This is unashamedly a cultural message, but based upon the meticulous work that they did on the environmental footprint of foods. So they went basically the Swedish route. They said we have to recalibrate culture as opposed to Sweden, a rich country, saying we've got to eat less but better, if you like. In Brazil, they still have enormous amounts of poverty and people who need to eat more, but this is the message that they crafted to try to address that. So we have, if you like, a new localism emerging as a very interesting cultural force, not about nutrition or environment, but addressing those issues at the cultural level, at the identity level. And this is something that I think we need to work on more and we academics need to help more. But we have, uh, at the same time, vast amounts of industrial capital. The food industry is arguably the most powerful industry in the world. It's the biggest employer in the world. The 1.25, at the very least, billion people work in food. Most of those just in agriculture. But in terms of off-the-land work in a country like Britain, the food industry employs 3.8 million people. It's the biggest employer in Britain. It's... Uh, three and a half times bigger than the National Health Service. It's bigger than the military. It's as big as, the, uh, 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 as one can get. And there is a split in the food industry between this, high-tech stuff to resolve it, below the radar sort of approaches, and also a totally different approach, choice editing, altering what the consumer has to choose, removing things below the radar, some of these are really well ensconced. Marks and Spencer's Plan A is now 10 years old, has made them money, it saved them money, uh, and is on 100 criteria, not dealing with one criteria, on 100 criteria, ratcheting up across the whole sales platform of Marks and Spencer's. And within that, food being a very big feature, as you probably know. Lots of really important and interesting things going on from inside the food industry. This uh, one here, 2002, the Sustainable Agriculture Initiative. Some of the very biggest food companies in the world realized 15, 20 years ago, if they didn't start dealing with reducing their environmental footprint, they would both have reputational damage, but also they wouldn't be able to exist. So there is a really extraordinary coming together of the public health arguments uh, and the environmental arguments with some of the self-interest of, of how capitalism works. Here's the biggest pasta company in the world which developed this, um, uh, a very conventional sort of nutrition-focused pyramid on, on the left and just inverting it and saying, well, environment goes together. They said they took, a, if you like, the same approach that the British government took, calories plus carbon. Uh, so there's some thinking going on. Where does this leave us? We haven't got coherence yet. Uh, the clock is ticking. 
uh, but attention is growing and evidence is growing. That's the picture. What next? Well, we've got this very interesting phenomenon of this. Here's the biggest conservation organization, its latest version of the Livewell plate, where they're just saying how uh, they're giving more and more detail of how dietary change has got to happen. And the big thing is meat, the purple on this. One has to dramatically reduce meat from what a conventional northern diet is based upon. Uh, not to extinction, not to zero, you note, but to very, very dramatically indeed. So where next? To finish. I think... I did my well, sitting at home today. Uh, I thought, okay, what's my answer to this? Okay, here's my three minutes with the Prime Minister. The first is we do need for new frameworks. We've got them emerging at the global level. We haven't got them at the European level. We began to get them at the European level with the sustainable food communique, but President Juncker dropped it. We still don't know why. In 2014, he was appointed within a week two years' work, the document was all written, was dropped. This happens in food, by the way, quite a lot. Uh, but the European Union then hitched its ride to the circular economy thinking. Let's treat food as a material entity, of recycling it, treating it as an object, treating it as a biophysical thing. The problem is that doesn't deal with the cultural dimension, doesn't deal with consumer engagement. As the big food companies have discovered they can shave off carbon without you knowing it and reformulate without you knowing it, unless the Daily Mail gets hold of it. Uh, uh, but in the end, you've got to eat less. If you follow me on Twitter, I tweeted today that now a new study come out in the Grocer, that well-known academic journal, uh, one, in five, one in five British consumers is now eating the whole packet of biscuits. They're not eating one biscuit, they're eating the whole. And actually, yesterday, I sat in a tube and watched someone with me eat a whole packet of biscuits. The lot. They're switching from cakes and expensive things, buying biscuits because they're cheaper, but then eating the whole lot. This is not just treating food as a material, recyclable, circular economy opportunity. So we need a new framework. Secondly, we have got to use all the methods. There's no single answer to sustainable diets. There's no single bullet. You can't just shave off carbon. You've got to deal with that complicated multi-criteria. As I put it here, we need carrots and constraints. The Eat Lancet report, by the way, is going to be very, very interesting on this. I won't flag anything, but I will say, I think we need to do much more work on financial incentives, just as the climate change world has got disinvestment programs. Why leave your pension in a company that's going to destroy the ca capacity of your grandchildren to exist? We need to do the same in food. Why have any money in a company which is going to undermine your capacity for the future? And in animal welfare, I look at uh, Angela, our chair here, there's a very interesting, really powerful process occurring with the... Uh, um, the Jeremy Collars uh, fund, a huge multi-billion uh, finance fund uh, and a project called FAIR, F-A-I-R, double R, uh, which is worth looking at. So all hands to the deck, really. We've got to change the consumer food environment. Uh, my colleague Martin Carraher here has done really wonderful work on that, just showing how, how can you expect children to eat well when they can't walk out of the school or into it without going past fast foods, enticing them. And we in the London Food Board have just announced um, attempts to try and change the planning conditions there. We've got to recalibrate the local geography, literally change the local environment to alter the price signals. Some of this, the, the horse has already bolted from the stable, but some of it I think we're going to have to be tougher, frankly. I'm looking at Martin. See, I think we're just going to have to be harder to reframe the local environment. You cannot expect kids, if they're, they're a sweet-smelling, fatty, sugary, salty foods on offer for less than a pound, and they've got a pound in their pocket, you can't expect them to do the rational thing. Uh, we need sustainable dietary guidelines. I think that goes without saying. We've got to engage all actors. 
It's not going to be dealt with by brilliant nutritionists. It's not going to be dealt with by brilliant environmentalists either. It needs multiple disciplines, multiple criteria thinking, exactly what IFSTAL is about, food systems type thinking. And that's where I think the academics can be very helpful. Uh, we have a really important role. And I summarise this as being the SDG squared strategy, or Pamela Mason and I in our book did, but I'd sort of um, been floating this earlier, um, sustainable dietary guidelines to meet the UN sustainable development goals. Um, so to conclude, uh, I think we have grounds for optimism. We also have grounds for pessimism. If the modelling that will come out from the Lancet report is, uh, I'm an eternal optimist for anyone who knows me, I think will agree. Even when things are bad, I always think, you know, don't worry, we'll sort this. Um, actually, we won't sort this. We won't sort climate change unless we do sort diet. It's as stark as that. Wait till you see the data. I'm not breaking uh, uh, um, embargoes because we're beginning to do speeches. Uh, but what that means is we've got a situation where, to summarise, food is the biggest driver of ecosystems damage, it's the biggest contributor to diet, dietary, uh, uh, or the biggest, biggest contributor to diet, obviously. It's the biggest contributor to ill health and healthcare costs. The food industry needs better frameworks. We've got to restructure the food system and do really big thinking like they did in the Second World War through uh, meetings like the Hot Springs meeting where really big, far-sighted thinking was going on. I think we need big, if style type food systems rethinking. Not two-day conferences, but as they did in the Hot Springs conference, three weeks thrashing it out until you've got an agreement. And indeed, that's a bit like Brexit, actually. <laughs> that's it. Now, welcome to those of you that joined during Tim's talk, and goodbye to those of you in Warwick, Reading and Oxford, who I believe are going to have their own discussions after this very inspiring talk. I know you'll have us excellent a discussion as we'll have here. So what we're going to do now is take questions from the floor. We have roaming mics and what I'll be asking is for three questions and then we'll consider those questions. But I'm going to start off by using chair's privilege and I'm going to ask Tim a question that's close to my organisation's heart. Uh, what role do you see for livestock in a sustainable food system, Tim? Mm, I thought someone might ask that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we'll, is that the first question? It is two the first more. question. So two more. There's a gentleman down the front in a grey top. Well, first of all, thank you for your lecture. My question would be, how feasible do you think the adoption of a plant-based diet will be in the near future uh, yeah. with the cultural change and, and do we have the time? Sorry, I did also meant to say, can you uh, say who you are and what you're Yeah, my name is Richard. I study global nutrition and health in Copenhagen and I'm currently doing that at Asmus Exchange at UCL. Thank you. Great. And there was a gentleman here in a dark grey top. Uh, hello, my name is uh, Ignacio Hurtado. I'm doing a master's here at SOAS in development studies, and uh, I, uh, I did a bachelor in gastronomy, so f f food is a language to me. I wanted to ask, how do, I mean, we've had for a long time the issue of food and nutrition, but how do you visualize the, these problems that we talk today for the common man outside academia? Because if, if we don't change the way that they see it, if we don't, make people understand the problem, we, we will never get anywhere. Let me start with that last one. Um, that's why I wish I'd been able to just leave up the Brazilian slide. I think, let me go and do it. Let me just go and put it up again. Because what I really like about Brazilian, I actually have deep affection for Carlos Monteiro who chaired it, because um, he's a very, very nice person. Um, I mean, if you look at this, you'll see, you know, they're really trying to do it 
in a way that speaks to ordinary people. And I mean, I'd have to give a totally different lecture. They, they presented meals. They, Brazil is going through the nutrition transition at the moment. I don't know where you're from, but it, it's going through this massive change from eating too little, not enough, major problems, hunger, some of that dealt with under uh, uh, Lula, but not enough. Uh, but uh, an explosion of what Montero and colleagues called ultra-processed foods. Salty, fatty, sugary processed foods which use commodities and dress them up to look like food and packaged and they're expensive. And they're seen as high appeal, high cultural appeal, big advertising budgets, hence the last thing. And they set out, said, look, they could do, they, you couldn't do this in Britain, except with immigrant populations in Britain. They said, eat like your grandmother did. You know, it was almost like Michael Pollan type thinking. And they said, eat beans, eat the traditional meals that you had to do, and improve them. But don't start eating deep pan frozen pizzas. If it's been advertised, think very carefully about eating it. I think of all of these, for me, that's the most powerful. And it passed. For those of us in, I look at Martin, my colleagues, what's a good food policy? Well, I've spent 45 years trying to think about that, and I'm not quite clear yet. Um, but I think the rule that the Institute for Government here in London developed is a very good rule, which is a good... Good policy is one that survives a change of government. It's a very pragmatic answer, but I'm interested. We, you know, here in Britain, we started developing food policy and food sustainable diet thinking at the end of the Labour government. I mean, it was just because of the banking crisis. If it had been under the Tories, it would have happened as well. And it was then all swept away. So you have to say, well, it didn't have enough support. There was no one supporting it. The Brazilian stuff has survived a change from left wing to right wing. And the right wing ministers are supporting this because they see the costs of not supporting it. So I think your question is right. And these, for me, the issue is culture. I, I, I'm not going against the six cell approach, but I think the thing that we're weakest on is culture. We're not engaging with your problem. And in, in my written version of this talk, I stopped myself from being very rude about chefs. <laughs> because I think some chefs are doing really good work on this. There's a new, young generation of chefs who are taking this very seriously indeed. And I think that's fantastic. Um, but I think we have a problem here about there, our thought leaders. Actually, there are some really good things happening in the worlds of chefs and catering. Uh, for me, one of the best projects around is the Harvard School of Public Health's work with the uh, Culinary Institute of America, the other CIA. That's the uh, Restaurant Association of America, CIA. And they've run this program called Menus for Change, where they take whatever the meal is being done in that canteen or that restaurant or the fancy hotel and they make it healthier. And they do it with working with the chefs. We need that on a mass scale. Why do we need that on a mass scale? It's because people eat more and more out. They're eating out. That's why the role of the companies is so important. And the explosion of eating out in Britain is remarkable. So it'll, the answer to your question, and it's actually the answer to Richard. Where is Richard? Is it you? I think it's, it's the same. I'm trying to give the same answer. You said, how feasible will the adoption of it be? Well, it depends, uh, it depends what effort is put into it. That's the point. And at the moment, we're not putting effort into it. It's patchy. There are little sort of foodie worlds where there's a bit of thinking about this. But, and there's some quite big systemic thinking going on in some big food companies but it's not joined up, it's not integrated. Now to Angela. The role of livestock. Well, you know this as well as I do. She's setting me up. 
<laughs> um, we have to reduce cattle, but not by increasing poultry, because the poultry are the fastest growing users of grain. The issue is grain. 30 to 40 percent in different countries, it varies, even here in Britain. Uh, of grain is fed to animals. We're literally making animals our competitors for land use. And when you look, wait till the Lancet report comes out and you look at the land use studies. Don't wait for that. Look at Henri de Ruta's wonderful PhD. I examined his PhD at Aberdeen, working with Pete Smith, as, sort of, as I always say to him, the god of British thinking on land use. This is global work. It's fantastic. Uh, De Reuter's two studies are just sensational. You cannot deal with ecosystems or climate change problems unless we reduce animals. <laughs> we cannot do it. So that means thinking about animals in a different way. Uh, this is my answer. I keep saying it. Uh, I used to breed cattle. I was a farmer. Uh, there isn't an animal I haven't killed, but I don't eat meat now. Uh, or sent to slaughter. Uh, we've got to put animals back in their ecological niche. And they're not. That's my philosophical answer to you. Thank you, Tim. And I use your ecological niche um, answer quite she's, frequently. She's a vet gone wrong. <laughs> That's gone not wrong. fair. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so we had a question from up the back from the last round. They were big, big questions. I'll try and keep shorter answers. Did that sort of... The, the, you couldn't see it. And the speakers here were nodding. behind the column as well. <laughs> so um, my name is Seth Cook from IED. Thank you for more, a wonderful lecture. The question is about agrochemicals, both pesticides and fertilizers. The, it's kind of timely because the glyphosate um, license has just been renewed. What is your view on their role, their importance, and the argument that Without them, we can't feed 7 billion, let alone 10 billion. Yeah, okay. Next question. Hello. Oh. Um, yeah, um, I'm, uh, my name is Pablo. I'm from the Royal Veterinary College. Uh, I have a question. So you say there is no magic bullet to solve this uh, issue. But I was just wondering the role of technology. I mean, you showed a picture about this a person who created this burger from the lab, for example. And somehow we all think there needs to be some kind of food revolution coming from this technology. I just wanted to get your view. Are we, is that coming or, or what's going to happen? Yeah, good question. Yeah, I'm Tony Allen, now formerly at SARAS, currently mainly attached to King's, but now I hang around um, Tim's food center because that's the, the most... Um, a productive place in terms of good ideas on food. Um, I'm a water person. I discovered that uh, we had to take an interest in food and, in fact, be prepared to recognize that what happens in the food supply chain determines what we can do with water because 90% of the water that we consume um, is in our food. Uh, and farmers manage that. Um, farmers manage 90% of the water. The... the, <coughs> the um, uh, corporates manage about 1%. <laughs> so it, it, clearly farmers are doing the job. And we don't know that. We don't give them the credit for that. What I want to ask you, Tim, is something you probably can just say yes or no to. Um, what I've discovered in trying to understand the food supply chain with your or the food system with your health, health is that it delivers what politicians need. Uh, you've indicated how often they block things, uh, <laughs> decade after decade, and the reason they do it, I suggest, is because we have a system that delivers underpriced food, both at the farm gate and at the supermarket shelf. Um, <coughs> they deliver underpriced food to underpaid people. <coughs> Therefore, we have a lock-in <laughs> that um, politicians have got to keep saying no because the system seems to work and it gets them through to the next decade. That, that's a very typical, I'll deal with that last one first, that's a very typical Tony Allen short question. 
so I'll give a very untypical Tim Lang short answer. <laughs> He's smiling, by the way. Um, I agree with you. I think it's a lock-in. I agree with you, farmers are the key. Uh, the problem we have in Britain, as you know, Tony, and some people here know, I'm very heavily focused on Britain at the moment because of the B word, uh, because <laughs> it's a disruptor. It. It's a disruptor. It's a... Uh, but it's also an opportunity to think about what do we want to do with our land? What's land for? I was at a dinner of the former commissioners of the SDC the other day, and they reminded me that I wrote a paper for the SDC saying, what's land for? This is a very philosophical question, but actually it's what we have to ask. What's land for? At the moment in the British economy, land is for housing. The point of a bit of land is to build something on it and to realise its capital opportunities. But the lock-in that you talk about is a really critical one. And if you notice, I didn't speak about it in my written version I have, which is basically what it means is we've got to rethink the economics of the food. That's the issue. Uh, and this is the really thorny issue about what's the real cost of food, the true cost of food. Uh, and the figures are quite sober and fairly easy to calculate. Uh, that, you know, where we've got cheaper food uh, proportionately within our domestic spending, but it's actually costing us more elsewhere. Actually, in real terms, the food prices have gone up. It's not cheap at all. It's just proportionately out of domestic expenditure, it's come down on average. I mean, the figures for Britain, 1950, about 30% of average domestic expenditure worked on food. Now it's 9%. If you include eating out, it's 12%. Okay. So that's a huge amount of money you can spend on clothes, computers, cars, you know, holidays, having children, you know, whatever you want to spend it on. Uh, downloads, sorry, iPhones. <laughs> the problem is that the bill for the other bits is going up. The tricky thing, I think, Tony, is actually is the low wages issue. Not the price of food, but the low wages. Why is food so consistently low waged? Is for me... I started on that actually 45 years ago. That's what I was interested in. And I've come back to it. I think it's the big question. And I look at the figures of where the British food economy goes and the money goes everywhere except to primary producers. Primary producers get either 5% in some sectors or 8% of the money that consumers spend on food. The retailer or the caterer will get maybe 25%. So the primary producer is not getting the money. How can we get more money to primary producers so that they do the right thing, look after the water, look after the ecosystem? I think that means having less of the others. And that's why this Brazilian one is so interesting, because it's basically saying, let's keep people on the land. That's actually what the, the politics of this amounts to in Brazil. Here in Britain, we've got 0.2% on the land, really, it's about 400,000 people, it's tiny, out of 27, 27 million people working. So this is a huge issue Tony is raising. Um, uh, agrochemicals and glyphosate, where are you? Wave, there you go. Um, can we feed the world without Monsanto? Um, it depends what you eat. You notice in the banking crisis immediately out came the, the dire Malthusian positions that we're all doomed unless we double food production. Or actually the often cited uh, figure is we've got to raise production by 70% by 2050. You know it as well as I do. It depends what we eat. If a huge amount of that is going on producing the grain to feed the animals, to become competitors, to add to climate change, this is false economics. And other studies have suggested that you don't need that 70% growth. There's actually too much food. I'm sufficiently old and um, not needing refability to dare to say there's too much food, not too little. The problem is maldistribution. That's a very different issue. The problem is lack of affordability. The problem is very different. It's in the heart of the political economy. Uh, so, I mean, broadening that on the technology front, certainly this is obviously my thinking. Uh, I put up that slide of the technology. I'm actually now more interested in the technical approaches. I don't, I'm always very nervous about technical fixes. You know, the quarter of a million dollars uh, meat substitute 
burger um, is not mass scale. But let me just tell you, there is a huge amount of money, indeed a wall of cash from California is going into meat substitutes at the moment. Yeah. Angela's world know that. They like it, actually, because they see it as removing the stress from animals. This is not going away. Uh, but is it addressing the issue of the cost of food? I'm not yet convinced. Um, is it exploring technical possibilities? Yes, it is. And why that matters, I am now convinced, why I've taken an interest in it again, is because of the land use issue. Almost certainly we need to stop, I repeat, stop any expansion of land use. In other words, we have to produce what food we want from the existing land, cropland, that is already being cultivated. The implications of that are immense. It means you can't eat as an American. The problem is America will want to carry on eating as an American. This is why food is going to be enormous politics with a big P, very big P. So, you know, you younger people, be prepared. This is going to probably get nasty and it's probably going to get very serious. So I, when I was asked to do this lecture, I thought, actually, this is precisely why I get out of bed. To, you know, I'm a teacher. It's your young generation who are really going to have to be addressing this and also will have the consequences of it. So, no, no magic bullets, but I don't want to encourage you to think, ignore technology. No, uh, there is fantastic technology for dealing with recycling and for cutting down waste. For me, one of the big problems I didn't mention, uh, but I'll flag it now, is actually a problem of packaging. Packaging, you know, I, you know the, the role of plastics has been one of the revolutions of my lifetime. It's made food safer, but it's now destroying uh, fish. Uh, it's coming in all sorts of ways that's emerging. It's in us. We don't need to experiment with nanotechnology when you're eating fish. And in my written lecture for tonight, you know, but if you needed any convincing, you have to think about the nutritional advice about fish. The British government is still saying eat two portions of fish a week, one of which will be oily. It now is also saying try and eat those sustainably. But where is the pressure on eating sustainably? It's all left to a devolved NGO, the Marine Stewardship Council. This is pathetic. The Swedish dietary guidelines said, no, we'll make these national. So there's a very important political fight. Those of you watching the Brexit issue or the <coughs> politics around that, this is an opportunity to be arguing coherently for sustainable dietary guidelines to apply to your child's school meals. This is the time to really get into that politics. It's dead serious stuff, actually. Uh, and, but the possibilities of doing it are there. We've got the opportunity to do it. So I don't, I mean, these are huge questions, but I'm trying to give you a little bit. Shall we have the next round? Okay, there was a, a lady that we missed the last time around. She's got a hand up behind the column at the back there. Are these giving the answers that you want? Is it okay? Not fallen to sleep yet? I mean, these are big <laughs> choices. Time, big choices we've got to make. But I think it's ultimately about politics. Hi, Laura Hamilton. I'm a researcher and PhD student at the Thomas Coram Research Unit at UCL. Um, I work on the families and food and hard times study. Um, given my PhD is about food and income inequality, and you've already sort of mentioned food costs and affordability and wages, yeah. um, it's kind of a two-pronged question. I just wanted to know what you think that us as individuals can do other than eating a plant-based vegetarian diet um, in order to live sustainably, but also whether you think it's actually going to be affordable for those on low incomes? Yeah, okay. Okay, there's a gentleman with a scarf in the middle there and the gentleman in the red on the end. And that's it, I think it's going to do for questions tonight. Hi, I'm Frederick Meif. Um, I'm studying environmental policy and regulation at LSE. And my question is about effectiveness of policies. So um, we have these uh, nutricultural advices and um, 
other information disclosures have there been studies on the effectiveness of those and um, are there maybe other alternatives or do what do you think are the uh, most effective policies to tackle the issue thanks Uh, first of all, congratulations on a very clear and inspirational uh, presentation. Uh, my name is Andre. I'm a PhD student at the University of Reading. I'm also for Brazil, and I used to work on our, similar to our NHS, which is called SUS, so that document was used by me on a daily basis, and it was, a, I would say, a very good accomplishment for, for us to be able to change this from our 2011 documents. Yeah. But, however, we have a very, uh, one of the biggest, I would say, mid-industries of the world in Brazil as well. Uh, considering sustainable uh, diets, how do, do you see or how would you say it's, is it feasible with this neoliberal area, uh, neoliberal era, sorry, of constant economic growth and speculative uh, profits? And if it's not feasible, how would you say we can uh, use strategies to influence companies to make a positive change? Thank you. Are you prepared to take one minute? I am prepared to take one minute. Lady, Lady Dunn here has been waiting. Um, and we are um, sort of running out of time for the question session. So if you can be as brief as possible, Tim. Impossible. <laughs> Hi, um, my name is Kimi. I rescue cats from the torture festival in China. And um, I wanted to ask a question about the table of criteria to consider when you want to recommend a st sustainable diet. Why is taste and culture so important? Because we've seen the number of vegans increase so much, especially this year. So don't you think people are ready to make rational choices and maybe those criteria can be left aside? Hmm. Thank you. Well, the answer, I'll do with that one very quickly. The answer, why is taste and quality so important is because that's what people say it is. It's just the evidence is that they won't eat things if they don't like it, or if they don't think it's culturally appropriate. But that said, I'm a social scientist, uh, we have ways of changing people. Uh, and I'm a psychologist gone wrong. Half of psychologists go to work for the advertising industry, and the others work in the mental health world to deal with the problems caused by the other half. That's basically what psychology's <laughs> contribution to the modern world is. Uh, I have one brother, he worked on the other side. So you can tell, he used to remove his documents from the room when I walked in. Uh, but we get on fine now. Uh, taste and quality are very important because they're very deep-seated. They're what we get taught. They're about our existence, about our identity, about what we like. Uh, and it's very hard to get people to change. You can change them, and they do change. The British have changed their diet remarkably in the last 50 years. Indeed, one of the things that gets me out of bed over sustainable diets is I think we've got time to change people's diets. And you're right, you, you know, the rise of veganism and vegetarianism, it shows that things can shift remarkably quickly. But the problem is not leaving it to individual choice. This has got to be mass change. And that is the political question. This is the issue. Uh, the, the Dandre from Reading, the Brazilian. I mean, I think you're right. You, well, you've got a country which has a huge meat industry. Um, uh, but not just you, Latin America. The British and the uh, Spanish and the Portuguese uh, and the Dutch, to some extent, went into Latin America. The colonial expansion of the 19th century, as you know, was essentially about using other people's lands to resolve the Malthusian problem. I mean, British people, when they went to live in America in the uh, 18th century, uh, when studies began, all different sorts of studies, some sorts of studies, um, life expectancy went up, stature went up, weight went up. They improved because there was more food. They didn't get enough food in Britain. The revolution in food production occurred in the late 18th century, but really in the 19th century here. Yeah. You've got a problem that your colonial legacy was about meat and it's become a very powerful industry. 
Argentina, I think proportionally even more so. Uh, well, that's your politics. You've got to sort that out. Uh, and what the picture I was presenting, I may be wrong, but I think this is my reading of it and my colleagues who work in this area agree with this. We think gradually there's a sort of global picture emerging which is creating space for national countries, uh, sort of member states and national governments to start beginning to do something about it. But it also needs the bottom-up pressure. Uh, in our centre, we deal with and talk about multi-level policy interventions. On in one of my slides, I said there's no single bullets. There has to be multiple entry, multiple criteria, multi-level interventions. Your question was about neoliberalism and growth. Well, we have to get growth from other things. People need to work. This is about money, and money is the driver of people being able to live unless they have land. Uh, the neoliberal growth model is grinding to a halt in the rich world, even while it's expanding in the poor world. And that's what's happening at the moment. And it's very interesting. Unless you believe in contrative long waves, uh, where there are sort of 40, 50 year uh, cycles, um, we're having to prepare for big changes now. So I think it's back to the problem I was answering to Tony Allen about where does the money go? If you're interested in nutrition, I think you've got to spend more time looking at the money flows. Instead of saying, well, food banks are the answer to food poverty, why is there an overproduction of food? And why, when food is so cheap, can people who are on low incomes not afford it? It's that sort of thinking we've got to get at. And in Brazil, the people we, know, we work with in our centre um, are totally engaged with that. We've just had Renato, Renato Malouf with us as a visiting professor. Uh, the guy from LSE, where are you? I've lost my place. There you go. Forget the, sorry, Mr. Scarf, I wrote down here. Um, <laughs> the effectiveness of policies. Well, don't let's start. Let's go and have a glass of wine on that. Uh, because, you know, there's no one effective policy. The thing that almost all of us who work in this area would say, the problem is in food, almost all political attention is given to the weakest policy measures. Labelling education, information, not to tax, fiscal, regulation, laws. On this, we think laws are going to be necessary. And anyone who came to the meetings we held at our centre after the Brexit referendum, you know, heard me say, we're going to need new food acts. Here's our chance. We need a sustainable food act for Britain to lay down principles within which the food system is redesigned. The European Union is, in fact, next Thursday, the European Economic and Social Committee of the European Union is, I hope, going to pass by a very big majority a proposal for Europe to have a comprehensive food policy which includes calls for sustainable diets. And the Commissioner will be appearing in front of the committee next Thursday. So watch this space. Pressure is building up again. Although the sustainable food communique was withdrawn by Juncker and the circular economy is the only thinking that's replaced it, there is pressure to build up again that we need something better than that. Just at the moment Britain's leaving, things are getting interesting again. But for, for us in Britain, we need to be thinking in that sort of way as well. Then to go to Laura from Thomas Coram. Can individuals do anything? Yes, they can. But if you go vegan overnight, I would say, where's your soya coming from? Is this the answer? Uh, I'm more interested in what the Norwegians have done and Swedes have done, doing oat milks, for example, and I don't find enough thinking going into those. That's where the technical innovation can be very interesting, actually. But why have milk substitutes? I, mean, I can see the grounds for it. Uh, and people like it, and they're used to it, I think I wouldn't like not to have muesli for breakfast in the summer. I was brought up eating porridge. It's actually very hard to get English oats. You can't believe this. If you look at the, the production of oats in Britain, it's gone down. It's extraordinary. I blame Martin, you introduced me to Flavert's. 
<laughs> Very nice. The B word will stop that. Yes, the B word will stop it. It's great. It's become more expensive. It's, it's excellent. The good thing is food is going to get more expensive in Britain. But you blame the referendum for that. So can individuals do things? Yes, but the point of my whole talk, let's end with this, is that unless this is addressed at the mass scale, forget it. So this is not the time to be po-faced and say, I'm perfect, I'm doing the right thing, what are you doing? We've got to be thinking about movements and scale. If Angela and I are about to get up, I would say metaphorically, if this table here is the food system, you get some people under-eating and some people over-eating, and we're all consuming inappropriately, we've got to pick the whole table up and take it over there and still have the differences. You won't get people to eat the same, they don't want the same, they'll do things at different times of the life course. We're not talking about constraining people into you know, a monolithic diet. You're talking about systemic change. This is if style. This is why we set up if style. This is why John and I and the others went and worked for two years to raise the money for this. This is about systems change. And sustainable diets are so important is because there's a lot of thinking going on about production change, but not enough about consumption change. And that's what we've got to be addressing, sustainable consumption and production. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Tim. Thank you.